everyone, and welcome to another edition of Jay's Talk. And Matt and Andrew here to bring some baseball talk from our living rooms to yours. Make sure you go follow us on social media at Dunedin Blue Jays on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's guest was a 15th round pick by the Blue Jays in the 2016 draft. Please welcome pitcher Josh Winkowski. Josh, how are you doing today? Uh, doing about as well as we can do in this time, I would imagine. So just hanging in there, chugging along. Trying to stay busy, pretty much. You just told us before the interview you're playing a little war zone. Has that been a quarantine thing? A lot of war zone, Call of Duty playing? Uh, yeah, that's probably been um, a lot of war zone. I normally am a big multiplayer mo uh, multiplayer guy, but not a huge fan of this year's COD, to be honest. Um, the multiplayer is a little cheesy and a little campy. It really isn't my style. I like the more – I was a big fan of the jetpacks, so I love to fly, and I got, like, the whole setup and everything. So I love to play really fast. So Warzone's pretty much been it this year. Do you play with other guys on the team or um, – Occasionally I'll stop by um, – um, occasionally I'll play, Samad hits me up, Beck hits me up. Um, I have a few guys, unfortunately, Joe DiBetadetto and Jordan Barrett. I don't know if you guys know those guys. Unfortunately, they're uh, no longer with the team, but um, I play with them. Brady Boucher, uh, who's still with the Jays, I play with him a lot. So a whole bunch of baseball guys. And then a couple of local guys at home I'll play with and mix that in there. Are Samad and Beck, are they any good? Um, I've only played a few games with Beck. Beck plays Warzone just like he catches, very stubborn and my way or the highway. Um, so I, w I wouldn't say our synergy is the greatest, but I, he's got a pretty good shot. I I'd pick him over uh, a decent amount of people. So he's funny. Groshans is a real big uh, – Groshans and I talked about – because obviously in quarantine we're not like at our official affiliates, but the Jays have still given us like – kind of de uh they kind of just slotted us into like there's a whole bunch of guys in the done eating group and he and i were talking about trying to get like a war zone tourney with the done eating group or just with the jays affiliate uh org in general so he's really good he puts a lot of hours in. he plays a lot of uh he plays a lot of multiplayer he's a big sniper he's pretty good actually I'd probably been sniped by him a few times and slammed the controller down a couple of times or something. <laughs> so well, that's my – not to keep blabbering on, that's my whole – this game is like – in most CODs, I consider my aim to be above average or even elite. And it's like in this game, and no one misses. Like, it's so weird. Like, every player you run into in pubs and Warzone is like insta headshot with a sniper and just beams you with the growl or M4. There's not a lot of – there's not a lot of finesse in this game, and the, the aim assist is pretty strong in this one. So there's not a real big separator, in my opinion. But Let's go to your early life here. You were born in Toledo, Ohio. When did you first start playing baseball, man? Uh, I've, I, it's a typical – like, I remember, I think I have, like, a baby picture, and I've got, like, a – I've got my little – I'm, like, trying to hold a baseball up with my little hand. By no means am I actually holding it. Um I probably actually tweet that at you guys or send it to you in a direct message. It's kind of funny. It's like just a little baby picture. I'm holding the ball. Um, and then early on, it was the wiffle ball around the house. I'm sure my mom could tell you stories of a couple broken lamps here and there. Um, I know we had – my one house in Ohio was really long. It was like living room, dining room, kitchen, and it pretty much just all ran. And there was like Pretty much, if you sit in the kitchen, you can see all the way through the other side of the house. But it was just still decent. And then I know during the World Series, my dad, brother, and I would, like, set up the long hallway and literally would have, like, a little wiffle ball and bat in there and be, like, uh, pitching to each other and hitting and saying, like, it, depending on the hit, be like, oh, that was a home run or double or he struck out. And so pretty much just, like, running simulated baseball games during the World Series and other times of the year. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but then got into travel ball at that probably like that eight or nine range and pretty much just went from there. So it's as long as I can remember. You grew up a little bit in Toledo. Did you go in any uh, Toledo Mud Hens games when you were growing up? I, I still to this day kind of say that might be the uh, – I'm a big fan of baseball, obviously, before the Mud Hens. But that like in Ohio, that was like your field trip thing was go to a Mud Hens game for the day. Um, for school and everything and then um, obviously grandpa and dad took me there a whole bunch and um, 
that for triple i'm mean, like triple a is really nice in general but i know that place wins um that place won like as one triple a field of the year like four or five times and then there was a stretch where the mud hens had curtis granderson and a couple other guys i'm probably blanking on that maybe it had some big league times but they won uh they won the triple a championship like three years in a row three or four years so and that was like all while I was in that eight to nine, 10, 11 range. So um, that definitely sparked the love of baseball for me going to those games for sure. Who were some of your favorite players growing up? You know, you mentioned Curtis Granderson. Did you have any other favorite players growing up? Um, there was this one guy. So there's this one guy it was Mike Hessman. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's like one of those triple uh, A for life guys. I think his, his AAA career band average might be – like he might be a 310, 320 career hitter. But I remember there were several – the Tigers brought him up to the big leagues like three or four times thinking, oh, he's ready. He's finally made the adjustment. And I know he was hitting like 330 in AAA one year. And he was a home run guy. It was not just poke it the other way and get a single or double. He hit for power. And I remember he went up to the big leagues, and in a matter of a week, he was like 0 for 24 and got sent back down. And I think that was like the final time the Tiger was up. I think this was like the third time they had brought him up, and it was like that borderline, maybe October, September call up. And I think that was like the, the Tigers finally realized this wasn't going to work, and I think he just played another six or seven years in uh, AAA. And um, then like the last game was the last game of his career. He ended up playing like all nine positions. It was pretty cool. He uh, – there's a lot. If you ask a lot of people in Toledo, they'll like they'll recognize the name Mike Kessman. So he's a pretty good, cool guy. Then you moved to uh, Florida for high school. Um, you had your sophomore year. You went five and two with a 1.36 ERA and two complete games. How was that when you're transferring to a new school as a kid, uh, trying to play baseball? How's that transition for you going to a new school and a new team? Um, I wouldn't even just say it was a school, a new team. I mean, it was a whole bunch of things, funny stories. So I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> in Ohio, we had like one of the better travel ball teams. Like we were like third in our region, which was like eight or nine states and pretty much that whole Northeast of uh, the country. And I think we were like third in our, in that region. And I know the one year we went like 52 and three. And I think like the three games were just baseball, like, I didn't pitch well or so, or, or like a best pitcher on a team just had an off day or whatever happens, but uh, we still managed like 52 and three. And we got, uh, we played well enough to go to this Disney elite 32 uh, tournament, which was in Orlando, Florida at the time. And I remember like talking to my grandpa and he's like, you know, you're like one of like two Northern teams that's going there. And I was like, Oh, yeah, that can't be that big of a deal. But well, we ended up going down there, and like like I said, we had played like 55 games. We start playing teams that have 150, 160 games played, like 20 people on the roster. I think we we sent like 12 guys. Like we just – that was kind of normal. 12 guys, four or five guys throw, and then everyone else plays a position. And we went down there, and we went like 0 and 9. And I think we had like two close games. Even out of the nine, like two were close, and that was like the worst team in our bracket or uh, pool and just got absolutely smoked. And I, my mom never was a fan of the cold anyways. And I think, because even at eight or nine or 10, I would literally tell my like second grade teachers, I'm going to play professional baseball someday. And they would like, oh no, you got to be more manageable and be more uh, realistic with your goals. And I was like, nah, I'm going to make it work. Like it's going to happen. So I think even at like 12 years old, my mom and family and I were like, if this is what you want to do baseball wise, I think we need to get you south. And it wasn't just ball. Um, I'd say that probably was like half of it, um, but my mom definitely likes Florida and better in general anyways. Um, Ohio and Toledo specifically can get really cold and it doesn't even get a lot of snow, so it's like you don't even get the benefit of snow. Um, but yeah, we went down there, got absolutely smoked, and then like I said, we made, like you said, we made the move um, right before high school, and I remember I went from being like one of the better players in Ohio to then I showed up in Florida and it was like, I was at like real average to if not like below average my freshman year. Like I think um, – I don't even think I was like the best pitcher on my um, JB team freshman year. And then playing year round and probably a little bit of physical. I remember freshman year I topped 77. And then like I said, like a year later I was throwing 89. Just pretty much from like – because then in Ohio, I mean, you pretty much are playing like two and a half months and that's about all you can do. Yeah. 
And then, so then I go to play in like 10, 11 months of the year and I could just see the change was crazy. So it was a big adjustment. Like I said, I was not as good as I thought I was anymore and not like be one of the guys. Um, and I kind of had to earn that. And then even I went to a, I went to Cypress freshman and sophomore year and then transferred to a Stero junior and senior year. Um, for baseball, actually, the sterile baseball was a little bit better. So I, like, moved states, went to a new school, and then moved schools again. So it was it was definitely – high school was a crazy time for me, but made it work. So Yeah, and then you did well your junior and senior year, and then you uh, passed up the chance to play at Florida Southwestern State College. Was that easy for you? Did you know, I'm ready to go pro, I think I can do this, I can make it work? Or That was probably – that summer – um, so I got drafted, I think that was like when the ju drafts were more like early June, if I remember correctly, like June 8th, 12th range was when the drafts were. And I remember I ended up signing two, like a day or two before the deadline, which was like somewhere in like late July or August or something. Can't remember the exact date. But I ended up signing like two days before the deadline. And I remember I flip-flopped over and over. It was like, I would text, I felt so bad for my agent. I'd text my agent, yeah, I'm ready to sign. Ah, 100 grand isn't enough. I believe in myself. I think there's more in there. Because that was the thing. Like I, like I said, I was pretty good in high school. But I still, like, didn't have three pitches. I knew the velo wasn't done. So there was, like, a part of me that, was really, that like, really believed in myself and was, like, go to junior college, tear it up. It, even though it is Juco, it's still play, you know, and then, like, I think – like Nate Pearson gets drafted and then the first round out of JUCO like a year later. So it's not like it's not impossible to get noticed out of JUCO. So yeah, part of me was, part of me believed in myself to go to college and progress and do really good. And that part of me was believe that I could go into pro ball and make it work and kind of advance. So, and then eventually my offer got bumped up to 125 and for whatever reason that convinced me to sign. So that's kind of that story. But yeah, you can ask my mom. I probably flip-flopped eight or nine times like I was back and forth I could not made a pros and cons list and it was like literally the exact same like it was such a 50 50 coin flip like either way I think would have been good for me but it was a really tough decision for sure so you were talking a little bit about your velo bumps how much did coach Gary White help your career development and improve your velocity um he he, so he, he had some time with the uh, Orioles minor league system himself. So he kind of understood the game and the process that I was going through um, himself. I think he mechanical lot, when I showed up to Estero, um, I had a real bad, I was like a high three quarter. Like I literally would throw the ball like this with like my head out. Like it wasn't like I was like a high three four. So I was like almost straight over the top, like a point uh, cricket. Yeah, like pretty much like cricket. And he, he was like the first guy to kind of like – he kind of moved me down into a little bit more of a natural slot. And I think that helped with some movement and comfortability. Um, he definitely had a lot to do – he definitely helped with mechanics a lot. But I think his biggest thing that he helped me was more like mental. Um, I came into Astero and I've always been like super competitive and still really am. And sometimes it would get a little too much, even in the, even in the Blue Jays sometimes. Uh, Blue Field, I had some issues with that. Uh, but he definitely kind of helped me to uh, teach me to play the game the right way and kind of just the whole process of, like, taking care of your arm. And so he definitely helped with the velo, but I think, like, he made me a better ball player and uh, probably a better dude in general, um, a better person. So he kind of just took this really raw sophomore and kind of, like, um, kind of dialed, dialed me in and uh, – yeah, I, I owe a ton of uh, my success to him for sure. You were talking about the money too. And we also read somewhere where the Blue Jays offered to pay eight semesters of your schooling. How much did that mean to you uh, coming from coming from the Blue Jays? Uh, personally, I think, I think my mom can agree with this too. Uh, you can be as confident as you want and say, I've got the potential to pitch in the big leagues, but injuries are a thing. Um, just not performing, you know, like you look at my Bluefield year, I did not throw well in Bluefield at all. Luckily, I was able to recover in Vancouver, but who knows if I have another, if I go Bluefield, that Bluefield year a couple, two years in a row, who knows, we may not be having this conversation. Um, 
So you can be as confident as you want in yourself and your abilities, but having that school and backup for sure definitely was uh, definitely helped with the signing process. Because like I said, the, you know, I, I won't say my signing bonus was bad, but it definitely isn't up there with some of the other guys that scouts or uh, bloggers and all those guys drool over. Uh, but the Blue Jays definitely, like, they threw as many bonuses in college in there as they could, and that kind of showed me that they were, were – um, definitely really wanted to sign me as much as they could. So definitely helped a lot in the signing process for sure. And then walk us through draft day. What was draft day like? What were your emotions? Uh, what, what were you doing on draft day? Uh, I kind of – my draft day probably doesn't sound – uh, like a lot of other guys, I knew – so I knew I would get drafted. The question the question of where was probably the biggest thing. I heard stuff as – I heard stuff as early as, like, the eighth round, and then I heard – like, my agent was like, hey, you're a very good pitcher, but you just don't have the exposure. You can very easily slide to the 30s, 20s, whatever, blah, blah. So I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I don't know. I kind of, like – the fact that I knew I was going to get drafted, it wasn't like really, I wish I could say it was like a big deal. And I cried. It was like this big hoorah moment, but I remember kind of just sitting on the couch on my phone and my, um, and the Blue Jays actually didn't tell me I got drafted, which is funny. My travel ball coach was a Rockies coach and he was like in their draft room. And I remember getting a text from him and he was like, Hey, congrats. Like, uh, that's really awesome. And I was like, I sent back what question mark. <laughs> He's like, you got drafted by the Jays. And then luckily like, Finally, like five minutes later, I got a text from uh, Matt O'Brien, my area scout. Um, so it was kind of a weird process. I wasn't really like – I knew I was going to get drafted. So when I finally did, I can't say I was like appalled. I kind of just like told my mom, I was like, oh, yeah, it finally happened. Uh, I got drafted. And she was probably more excited than I was, to be honest. So, And then, like I said, I didn't even hear that I got drafted from the Jays, which was the funniest thing. So – Kind of a weird process, but still a crazy, like still a day I'll never forget. Obviously, um, and uh, yeah, it's still really awesome. How was that transition for you? Where you're you're going from high school to now you're in a clubhouse with big leaguers and other guys that are trying to com compete. It's a job now. It's not school. It's not just part of school. How much? How was that transition for you? Um, like I said, I. You can hear about it. And like I said, my high school coach prepared me as best as he could. So there wasn't a ton of things that I was shocked, but still living it, living it day in and day out um, doesn't replace hearing what it's like. So there was definitely a lot of adjustments. Um, but I wouldn't say it was like too bad. Like you said, probably the biggest thing was instead of going to school and going to practice and being with your buddies and um, the, game, the game being a game instead of now it's like it's a job. Um, and like pitching bad has repercussions or job stability repercussions, especially, um, you know, you never want to throw bad in high school, but it's like, if you throw bad on Friday night, the Friday night game, like just go sleep over at your buddy's house on Saturday and you'll forget about it. When now it's like, now it's like crap. My ERA is over four. Like hope Gill doesn't hope Gill's not, uh, putting me on the chopping block, et cetera. <laughs> so there's definitely a lot of transition. Um, but I think everyone's kind of in that same boat. I think like the guys in general, we kind of all want to make it work. I don't think anybody wants to be at each other's necks or not get along. So I think everyone, like, it's probably, I really haven't run into anyone in four years being with the Jays that anyone is like a major problem. Um, everyone wants to make it work and get along and play the best that they can. Cause if the hitters play good, it helps the pitchers. And if the pitchers play good, it helps the hitter. So like, your performance matters to you the most, but everyone playing well can build and help the team. So you talked about your, you had some struggles in Bluefield, but you've really picked it up in, uh, in Vancouver. You won the Northwest League Pitcher of the Year in 2018. What was working for you that season? Um, that was a really, like I said, that Bluefield year was really interesting. Because then uh, obviously you go to extended before Bluefield. And I remember in like two and a half months, I legitimately, I know it's, it's extended and it's not as serious. So I take it for what it is. It's not in season, but in like two and a half months, I legitimately gave up like three runs, like in two and a half months, like every outing scrimmage against another team was 
three innings, no runs, four innings, no runs, five innings, no runs, a lot of punches. And that's like when my, I was just getting a ton of ground balls. I like my sinker at that point was like really good. It was like, literally it was like ground ball, ground ball, strike out. Like I remember I had one extended game. My center fielder in the fifth inning had like, hadn't had to move yet. Like I don't think a ball had gotten to the outfield in like four innings or so. Like it was like at that rate. And then I go to Bluefield, and it was just like everything fell apart. And it was like, I'm not sure if it was more mental or physical, but I kind of got done with that season and said, like, hey, like, you better get it going. Like, you can't, can't do that too much more, too many more years. Um, and I kind of just told myself, like, I don't ever want to feel like that again because that was like a terrible, it was like bad outing, bad outing, bad outing. Like, that summer mentally was, like, not fun. So I kind of just went to Vancouver and told myself, like, it's time to go and don't let yourself – you know what you did wrong and uh, made a lot of adjustments. And coach, uh, our pitching coach, Cy, helped with that a ton. I owe him a ton of uh, thanks. Because um, even in uh, – he was with me in Vancouver and then even uh, Dunedin last year, the little bit that I was there. Um, and in both stints, he's helped me out a ton. He's another one of those guys where he's there if I need physical grip mechanical changes, but I think like he understands my mental aspect of the game more than most coaches do. And he helps me out there a ton. So I think it was like a really good combination of things kind of got in the groove, had coach side to keep me there. Um, and kind of just didn't let my foot off the gas and ended up having a really good year. So. Cy has such a great camaraderie with you guys. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've talked to Justin Dillon. We've talked to a couple other pitchers, and everybody praises Cy and, and, and his work ethic and his teaching abilities and just – the guy's uh, the guy's amazing. Yeah. I've even – I've seen the uh, little snippets of uh, these kind of talks on Twitter from other guys, like you said, the Dillon and Murray talks. Um, and those guys are not wrong when they talk about Cy. He – he is a coach, but he's probably he's probably one of those coaches. He's probably one of the easier coaches to forget that he is a coach. Um, like you get talking to him, and it's like you almost feel like you're talking to your uncle or something. And then it's like the game starts, and you see him walk out and the clipboard and everything. It's like, oh crap, this is my pitching coach. Like, um, which is a good thing, um, definitely not a bad thing. But yeah, he his under he's got he does a really good job at like I think he does really good at player to player. He kind of doesn't have this like one mold that fits everyone like he is really good at identifying your strengths and weaknesses and like he wants to make your strengths super super good big league all-star level and he just kind of want and he wants to make your uh, weaknesses like major league average so he does a really good job at like player to player adjusting and um like even just like I'm sure the talks he has with me are probably different than talks he has with other guys because I think he like knows what makes me go I can say that like if I have a bad game, he knows what to say to kind of keep me going and looking forward to the next start. And I'm sure – I know he can do that with other guys that probably uh, don't tick the same way I do. And then even in Vancouver, he was a big, like, go with the eyesight guy and his feel. And obviously, it's like a crazy experience of baseball. But then even having him last year in Dunedin, he's like, got the rap soda numbers track man numbers and he's like oh your fastball is spinning like this and you need to get it here I remember showing up because Mur uh, Murray and I pitched for a side in Vancouver then Murray was there in uh, Dunedin a little bit I remember showing up to Dunedin and then like a weekend I was like Murray who is this guy like like it was like the still same side but like his pitching coach and like knowledge and especially with the technology was like so different like I remember like when Murray showed up from college it was like Cy was a little weary of the weighted balls and just kind of all this whole new stuff and just wanted to make sure like him and Murray came to a good agreement and obviously it worked out um but Cy was still a little skeptical but then I get to Dunedin and Cy's like all about the weighted balls and because he went he went and did his research and he believes in like what he went and saw he went to, out to Seattle to go see all that stuff so I give a ton of props to him for making uh, the adjustments, staying with the times. Um, so, yeah, he's he's one of the better. I think him and um, Tony Caceres are probably, like, the two pitching coaches that have had the biggest impact on me so far. You also had a really good uh, – you also had a really good time in the Midwest League. Uh, how was getting a start in the Midwest League All-Star game this past season? That was uh, – 
that was probably one of the, that was one of the moments where I actually probably got caught off guard. Um, like I said, a lot of things, I don't always get like super excited on like news or stuff. Um, but at the time, especially not being a prospect or not even really being like on anyone's radar for the most part, that at least that I was aware of. Um, and there was like, obviously when you go to those all-star games, like there are definitely some guys that make it there because they are a prospect. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure the numbers are good. Um, but there were a lot of, like a lot of big time prospects, like uh, guys in like the top 10 for their orgs. Um, so when the, when the manager of um, – South Bend Cubs. I think when he told me, um, oh, because we were, I was there with two other pitchers, and we were all kind of wondering when we were going to go throw. And I was the guy that actually went into the. Oh, I finally um, sucked it up and went into the office, and I was like, hey, like the lug nuts are kind of curious, like where we're going to be at in the game plan, and just when when we should be ready or if we're throwing. I, I don't even think all of us knew if we were going to throw or not. And he was like, yeah, I've got you scheduled to start the game, and then I think um, it was like Kobe Johnson and some other guys. And when he told me that, it was actually, I was, like, really surprised. I was, like, really? Like, you need, like, you know it's me, right? Like, Minkowski, like, not, like, you've got, like, other dudes that have signed for, like, $5 million, $6 million, like, in the locker room over there. Like, you sure none of those guys are starting? Uh, so, it was a pretty crazy um, – it was a really big honor, too, because I had a lot of family there. Um, obviously, it was, like, close to Ohio. So, that was probably, like – that's probably one of my at least top three moments in baseball so far, for sure. How was getting to uh, get out of the cold and come back to Florida and uh, be closer to home and uh, obviously also get to take a step up to high? Uh, that was a little bit of a mixed feeling because um, it felt like I felt like I got the worst of Lansing with the really cold, and then it was like I'm showing up to Dunedin right in the middle of summer. So I always joked with my mom, it was like, I got the worst of both worlds, uh, which is funny. But obviously, anytime you can move up a level, that's a huge honor. Um, and I was really excited to do it and make the jump. Um, you kind of hear the like high A's when it really starts getting like the level of play kind of takes a jump and starts getting really competitive. Um, not that the Midwest League is like shabby by any means, but I definitely feel the difference between low A and high A, especially this year. Uh, but definitely being closer, my mom came to a ton of games and a couple of her friends and family. So having them close and definitely like being at a higher level, it was a ton of fun. I really liked it. So it was a really like really good group of guys at both levels too. That was the other, we had a really good thing going in uh, low A and I was kind of worried. I was like, oh, I'm going to go to high A and not have like as close of buddies or the team may not be as close, but both levels were like, had really good camaraderie this year. So that was a lot of fun. You, you got to play close to home in Estero when you played the Fort Myers Miracle. Other than the uh, CJ Crone uh, home run in front of your friends and family, uh, how was that experience? And then what is that experience like when a major league rehabber steps into the box, uh, when you're on the mound, are you thinking any differently or are you just attacking each guy as if they're who they are? Um, so a couple things on that point. Unfortunately, when I threw that game at home, I hadn't thrown in 12 days. I was starting to run into my innings limit. So it had literally it had been like two weeks since I had thrown, which kind of threw me off my groove, unfortunately, uh, which sucks. It had to be the one game. It was like in my hometown. Um, and then, like, against a big league rehabber, uh, but still made the best of it. Um, unfortunately, I probably was a little stubborn. I pretty much – I was, like – I remember the home run. It was, like, 3-1. Instead of, like, throwing a sinker or a slider, which is, like, my best pitches, I remember literally thinking, let's see what you got. Like, and I remember I just pumped 96, like, up and out – up and outside to him, right-handed hitter. And he acted like it was, like, 89. It just turned on it. And I think my pitch uh, – Sai, after the inning, was, like, you know, you should – you can throw him a slider or two, right? And I was like, yeah, I want to see what he had. And he's like, well, that's what he's got. He's got opposite easy power on you. That's what he's got. And I was like, yeah, I know. Like, it's a little bit of a learning lesson. But, hey, you want to play in the big league someday, you got to square him up a little bit sometimes. So, see what he's got. Yeah, so you talked about it a little bit. You went from 68 innings pitched in last – the year before. And then this past season, you got up to 127 what, how do you deal with that uptick in innings? Uh, how tough is that? Um, personally, I, uh, that's kind of a bonus for me. I think 
kind of mentioning that 12 day, I've always been a guy, the more I throw, the more comfortable I get, honestly, like, um, a lot of guys later in the season start saying like, Ooh, the, this is getting sore or starting to feel this and that. Like I remember at the end of Vancouver, um, a lot of guys were starting to run out. And I know some of those guys had pitched in the college season, which is a little bit more, um, a little bit tougher and, uh, severe than like extended and spring training is. Um, but yeah, towards the end of Vancouver, like when it, Vancouver season ended, I like the last, like my last two starts, I told Cy, like, this is the best I've felt all year. Like, I feel like I finally like locked it in. Like the velo mechanics felt good. And same thing in Dunedin. I remember when Cy told me I was running to my innings limit. I was like, I feel fine. Like I just had my best. I remember right before my break for the inning, uh, inning limit, I just had my best velocity game of the year. Like I had sat 95 and a half and like was up to 97 which was one of my better um, velocity games. And I was like, I'm starting to really feel good and starting to dial everything in. He's like, yeah, it's org mandated, not much you can do, which I understand. Like, I get it. But so the innings limit thing for me, honestly, I didn't really feel like it was that big of a deal. Like I said, the more some guys later in the season want to start lessening bullpens and stuff. I'm almost – I like in Vancouver, I was throwing two – we were in a six-day rotation, I will say but I was throwing two bullpens in between outings. So I've kind of always been a guy, the more I throw, the better. Um, just something, the way my arm works or mechanics, I don't know what it is. But so the innings thing doesn't really bother me at all. Like I got, when Dunedin ended uh, really abruptly, unfortunately, like that was the other thing. I think we were all really ready for playoffs. Like I it had a couple, I had a couple, couple rough games and I think I'd finally like steered the ship back in the right way. And I was like, all right, I feel good for playoffs now. And I think, like, our rotation for playoffs was looking really nasty. Like, it was going to – like, you were going to get, like, Maximo, who was shoving, Al Geyer, me, Larkins, and Simeon. Like, Simeon had been throwing really good. Like, I think we were all, like, tuned up pretty well, ready to go. And then I, I think when it came down to it, if our hitters needed to get it done, I think they would have. So, um when that year, when that year ended and we got sent home, I was really, it was really tough because, like I said, I was really starting to feel good and I hadn't thrown, I haven't thrown in a playoff game yet, also. So that was the other. Uh, we in Vancouver, we missed it by one game, like both halves. If you know how the Midwest League or Northwest League uh, playoffs work, and then, like obviously, when I got there, it's Dunedin. They secure the playoffs, and I was really forward, looking forward to that, probably the most, to be honest. Yeah, it was a tough way to end the year. Yeah, it was not fun for sure. We were all really looking forward to that Charlotte Stone Crab series that was coming up there because they had some really top prospects against, and we wanted to we wanted them to come to Jack Russell and and then play them there and uh, in, in our own in our home field. Yeah, I remember. I know the one because um, I faced uh, Stone Crabs as Tampa, right? That's uh, Charlotte. Charlotte Stone Crabs. So. Charlotte, Charlotte Stone Crabs. That's the Rays organization, yeah. right? Yeah, because I remember I had faced uh, I had faced Franco in Low A, and I remember hearing like what a big deal he was. Like funny story, I remember we faced him in a three game series, and like in the first two games he already had three home runs. And I remember I was starting the third game, and I go on Twitter and I see an article from MLB, and it's like Wander Franco hasn't swun and missed in like 120 swings, or like it hasn't struck out in like three weeks. And, like, my personality is, like, I literally said, like, that's not, like, that's done. Like, this is not, like, I'm, old, like, that's not happening. Um, and I ended up, was fortunate enough to get in the swing and miss and, like, strike out. I think I only got him once that night. Um, but, yeah, I got him to strike out. And uh, that's just kind of, like, that, uh, that sums up my personality in general. Like, I saw something on Twitter and I was, like, all right, like, this is stupid. Like, this is not happening. Like, this is going to end. Kind of went, and, like, if you look at, if you look at Franco's like swing and miss, it's almost better than like what Vlad's numbers are in the minor league. So he's like a very serious prospect. So I give him props, but yeah, that, that stone crab series would have been a lot of fun. I think that was like two really um, packed teams. And I'm sure if you look in the big leagues in three or four years, you'll probably, I know like Garrett Cole and um, who's the guy for the Ray Rays, a really tall pitcher. Blake Snell. Uh, the righty up to a hundred. Uh, why am I blanking? He pitched game five against the Astros, got smoked in the playoffs. No, the really tall – he got traded for uh, Chris Archer. Why am I blanking on that? Oh, uh, Glasnow. Yeah, Glasnow. It's like Glasnow and 
Cole were on the same Pirates team. I'm sure in the big leagues they'll be doing the same thing with, like, that Dunedin and Stonecraft's team. Like, hey, these, like – I'm sure if, like, the Blue Jays and Rays face each other, you could probably have, like, seven, eight guys on the screen that all were in high A in uh, 2019, so. Josh, we want to say thank you for taking some time out to sit down with us and talk some baseball. Anything you'd like to say to the fans out there before we sign off? Appreciate the fans when coming out to games and everything. The support means a lot in general, and just hope uh, hope we can get to play for them again this year. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, fans, for tuning in to another edition of Jay's Talking. Matt, Andrew, and Josh Winkowski signing off.